We're so happy you're here, Ed, but I am more than thrilled to introduce you to our um, our gardening guru, Ann Lovejoy. Hi, Ann. Hey, Karen. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. So we thought about some things to talk about. I was going to talk a little about pruning roses and about sowing seeds and doing transplants and stuff like that. But if anyone has issues you want to talk about, please just jump in because you know me, I can talk for a really long time with on <laughs> I need That's to be love about you or redirected so <laughs> let me start with roses though because I've had a lot of questions about that um typically in this part of the country we want to prune roses in the middle of February which is coming right up however this particular middle of February we're supposed to be getting some really cold weather um that wouldn't matter very much to a lot of the shrub roses and a lot of the old species roses, but it certainly could matter to some of the hybrid teas and some of the fussier. Okay, here's the deal. The more expensive the rose was, the more likely it is to be damaged by frost. Mm -hmm. um, that's just a rule of thumb. But the thing is some of those tender plants, uh, they might, in the, when it dips down into the 20s, you can see some frost kill, some winter kill on the top growth. So I would hold off if you haven't already started whacking away on those roses. Why don't you wait a little bit, do it a little later this year, because the point of leaving the top growth is it's there to be killed. And that part you can sacrifice and it will protect the lower branches. Um, so, and you know, who knows, we've been told it's gonna get super cold before and it hasn't. We've been told it could have 15 inches of snow. Now snow is actually a great insulator. So if it does snow, that's actually good news because it will keep the ground at about 32, um, which is you know freezing, but not sub freezing. So that protects roots and it protects actually the upper structures too, as long as it's piled around them. You can actually get a snow shovel and shovel extra snow on tender plants. Um, put maybe some compost or mulch or loose leafy straw or something like that over the top, shovel snow on top of that, and it will actually keep protected if it does dip down the way they say that it might. Um, of course, you take all these precautions. A, we don't have snow right now. <laughs> it may never happen, but it's always worth making sure you have some protections on hand. If you already have started cutting your roses back and you know that some of them are on the tender side, you can do stuff like um, put a uh, some woven row cover or even a sheet over the top of that plant um, to give it a little extra protection. Usually row cover gives about four to five degrees of, pro of frost protection. So two or three layers would help even more. Um, if you're worried about the look of it, you can quickly stencil an attractive border on the top of it and make it put a bow perhaps or something like that. So to keep the tone up, but basically you're just gonna wanna put it on for a day or two. Um, usually if we do get these cold snaps, they don't really last all that long. And again, if it does actually snow, that's usually gone pretty fast too. So you, what you want is a temporary protection, not like building a whole construction uh, for the rest of the winter because it's doubtful that you'll need it very long. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. So when you do get around to cutting the roses, you want to have the right tools. And I brought in my, um, these are Baco pruners and they are, uh, I love them because they're sized to, your, to different, they have different sizes for different sized hands. Um, and a lot of the pruners are really big for my hands. My hands are kind of small. And these all have adjustable blades. You can replace the blades and you can sharpen them which is something you really wanna do right about now, especially if it is gonna be cold and snowy and you're stuck inside, take the time to sharpen all your tools or in the more sustainable manner, cause them to be sharpened by someone other than yourself. I'm looking at Don Fox, for instance, and thinking if I lived in the same house with him, I'd be handing him my tools right now. Um, <laughs> right? Yes. So, and the other excellent tool is small, but these are the ARS fruit clips, fruit pruners, you can see they've got a little bit of a curve to the blade, which is great. When you put it in your pocket, it doesn't stab you, <sighs> bonus. Um, also, when you're cutting on a branch, you can place the curve against, say, this is the mother branch, here's a side branch. I'm gonna place the curve against the side branch and the between the side branch and the mother, and it gives me a little bit of protection. I'm not gonna gouge into the main branch, right? 
and I think that I may have said this before, but I'll say it again, when you're pruning on pretty much anything except a pine tree, you'll notice that the, the stem has a little bit of a throat, like the stem's coming off the side. There's a thickening where it joins the main mother stem or branch. And you wanna cut outside that little throat, that neck, um, because if you cut that off, it's a great introduction for path pathogens to come in and, and wreak havoc with your plant. Uh, so you wait, you, when you cut, you cut on the part of the stem that looks straight like a straw. Is that, so not the swelling, outside the swelling. And you don't need to paint anything with tar or put that black goopy stuff you can get at the nursery. You don't need to put that on things you cut. If you're concerned, you can use some fresh compost and rub it into the cut. I've done that on occasion. Um, when I thought that there was verticillium around, I'd take some nice compost and rub it in and that kind of helps. It puts a beneficial bacteria and and other fungi fungi on the cut and kind of seals it off without, without still allowing air to get in, which is important for healing. Um, but when you cut that mother stem, will the little neck will actually slowly heal up and get sort of, they call it corky, and mm -hmm. it gets corky and soft and seals over and then it will gradually diminish, getting sort of taken back into the mother stem or fall off either one. But, um, but that heals it without letting disease in. So the other excellent tool I think you should all be aware of, which is filthy, is my gomboy saw. You don't need a gomboy necessarily. These are kind of expensive. These are Japanese um, Japanese saws that are actually used by woodworkers quite a bit. So they're finer than most of the, um, the pruning saws, but I think they're great because they do have a really nice cut. Again, you can replace the blade, which is really cool because people like me break them. Um, and you can, when you open it, you got one click for straight and another click for an angle if you need to angle in and you don't wanna cut the branch again. So if the branch is here, you wanna be able to get an angle or get into a tight corner with it. One thing I sometimes do if I'm pruning on something that has a lot of uh, multiple stems and I don't wanna hurt some of them is I'll take one of those silicone hot pads and lay it against the piece that I wanna protect and then you can cut, and even if you cut into it, it'll sort of bounce off. Oh. Um, and as far as I know, it's the best thing you can do with those silicone hot pads because I think they're really stupid otherwise, but they're great in the garden. Um, and then the other piece, I don't know if I can show you this or not. These are my Corona pruners, loppers, right? And these are great tools. They're not that expensive. Um, I got it at Ace and I, I don't know if it was maybe 35 bucks or something like that. I've spent a great deal more than that and had a lesser tool. So mm -hmm. I really like the Corona line. And after going many years and buying extremely expensive tools a number of times, I've kind of figured out some of them are worth it and some are not. Like the saw, I think it's worth it to get a really good saw because you're gonna get a clean cut and you're gonna reduce the number of wounds that you cause to your plants. Um, pruners, kind of same thing though. Bacos, I like these Bacos. They're less than Felcos, which are the supposedly top of the line. The point is these are called scissor cut pruners because mm -hmm. they cut like scissors. An anvil cut is the kind where there's a platform and the blades comes down and slices onto it. Those are also called the nurseryman's best friend because they tend to tear and snag and kind of rip up the, the cut, which means, again, nice opportunity for disease to move in, which means the plant will die and you'll need to buy a new one. So that's the, <laughs> that's the story with the anvils. We don't, I don't recommend those at all. Um, always a scissor cut type of pruner is a good idea. Some of them, this one has a lock that we're supposed to keep it shut. It works better some on, sometimes than others. I find them incredibly annoying because they all seem to have um, to get stuck quite a bit. So I know one of the best things you can do is take them outside and spray a little WD-40 on there and loosen it up and keep it kind of cleaned off. You may have noticed, I don't know how good your monitor is, but my tools are kind of dirty. I'm, it's true. Um, so this is a good time to, like I said, clean them up, WD-40, a little sandpaper on the shovel blades and some of your um, 
pruning blades, you want to use a little file. Um, I have one that's called a bastard file that I use to just put a nice little clean edge on your front and back. And that's really important because, again, you're not mashing the stems, you're cutting clean. And that's what's really uh, important. So suppose it's nice weather now. We're going to zip ahead a week or two and temperatures are in the 30s and 40s. Now you can prune your roses. And what you want to do depends kind of on what kind you have. For the low growing carpet roses that usually tend to be three, four feet high and wide, those you can pretty much, I, every year, take out the oldest, gnarliest stems all the way to the base. And usually they turn into this giant gumdrop. And you want to go in and take out the bottom so that you have a vase shape instead of a gumdrop. So you're removing the branches that are coming out straight on the bottom. And when you do this, wear eye protection because seriously, you can get scratched in your eyes. And um, get in there and make sure you have a tight fitting hat or something because otherwise you get your hair full of <laughs> stickers and stuff. But you want to get all the oldest, grayest, gnarliest looking stems out. Um, and that will leave a number of younger stems. And you want to space those. So when you start pruning actually anything, the three Ds are you take out anything damaged or deformed or uh, distressed, like looking like it's sick and going to die. So you want to remove anything like that that already looks like it isn't doing much. If there's a stem that doesn't have any buds on it, take it out. Get some air in there. Um, then. Anything crossing, when you have stems that are growing the wrong way, if it's growing into the shrub instead of out, you just nip that off. And get Again, you want air and light at the center of the shrub. That's a big piece for whatever it is, whether it's a rose or anything. Um, so once you've taken out the dead and the damaged, <laughs> you can start to see what you have more or less. And you can notice if the plant is leaning, then perhaps it actually requires to be moved. Um, Lots of times we forget that things that we planted 15 or 20 years ago next to a small baby tree are now being shaded pretty heavily. So you might want to move that shrub or limb up the tree, one or the other, to make sure it gets the light it needs. But remove when you have a crossing stem, you might remove both of them or you remove the one that's definitely going in the wrong direction or the weakest one or the smallest one, but you leave if you're going to leave one at all, you leave the strongest, best one that's moving in the proper direction that you want. I hope that makes sense. Yes. yes. So with roses, when you cut down, you can usually, lots of times, they still have foliage on them, which is okay, except that is really a vector for disease. So after you're finished with all this, you're going to clean everything away. But in the meantime, you're going to look down. When you have leaves on a rose bush, you want to prune to the next setup that has five leaves because the, the smaller twigs around where the buds are usually only have three leaflets per stem. And you want to put, look, go all the way down to the one that has five. Now in the winter, sometimes it's hard to tell that. So you would count down three or four. And on the stems, you'll see that there's, there's little teeny bud, baby buds here and there. And they're usually all around it, sort of in a spiral almost. And you want to choose to cut above a bud that's going in the direction you want it to. So I wouldn't choose a bud that's tilting inward. I'd go above that or below that and choose a bud that's going outward. And then you make a slanting cut, slanting from top to bottom a little bit and about a good half inch above the, the bud you want to break, the bud that you want to have um, produce a leaflet. Because that slanting cut helps rainwater run off and reduces the amount of pooling, which can be another disease factor because mold and mildew can build up in the little puddle. And if you cut straight, there's like as the as the stem degrades over the cut, it makes a little puddle holder, a little pool, and you don't want that. So slanty cut. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, has anybody got questions about this? I have I a comment. Have a comment. Um, um, I've heard, heard that, that. Uh, they call uh, garden tools weapons for pacifists. Have you heard that? No. Uh, that's a good. That's a good name though um, it's true. Like sometimes you just want to go cut the crap out of something, and especially around tax season. Um, so this is a great time to do some pruning. Say you've got some twiggy dogwoods. 
they always get really thickety and dense and you can go in there and thin them out and you'll feel like a, a vic, you know, victorious, a conquering hero. So yeah, it can be like that. But remember, you're always doing good, right? No, we're not hurting them. We're, do, we're giving them light and air. Yeah, and air, light and air at the core. Don't we all need that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? I have a question. It's so hard to trim the roses when they're still blooming. And I always seem to have a bloom or two all the time. <laughs> well, is it hard because you don't like giving up the blooms, you mean? Yeah. Well, here's this interesting thought. You're allowed to cut them and bring them in the house. Oh, I suppose. Yeah. So, and okay. that's one thing to think about. That we, a, lot of, a lot of roses, especially the modern, um, smaller ones, have been bred with hardy, really hardy species. So they do tend to bloom kind of all through the year. Um, back 40, 50 years ago, that was really uncommon. There was only a few and they were really cherished. But now it's pretty much... Uh, it's not unusual to have roses blooming through the whole year, but you want to give them a rest for one thing, right? Uh, yeah. And so one thing that really helps them is in the fall, letting th them, instead of pruning off all the hips as they start to form, you want to let them form some hips because the hips are, uh, they will send like a, a inhibiting chemical down the stem to tell the plant to harden off and get ready for winter. So hips are good. <laughs> and you want to make sure you're not trimming all the flowers off. Now you can because we're there um, and it's cold. But when you're pruning off those flowers and all the bit leafy bits and stuff, you want to make sure you really rake out well and get all that stuff out from under the bush because that is really a, a focal point for a lot of bacteria and molds and mildews and stuff like that. Um, and I always, once you're done, clear it out, rake it out really well, and then put down fresh compost. Um, and if even if it's a little hot, like uh, that's not bad right now because that will help kind of burn out the, whatever fungal um, molds and stuff are still hanging around. Uh, this is the time when all the molds and mildews wake up and this is perfect. They mm -hmm. love this weather, mm -hmm. right? So one good way to kind of get rid of that stuff is to do, because I always say in the fall, you want to leave stuff to compost in place and that's really a good practice. But now you want to put down some new compost on top of that or spread Comp composted dairy manure or something like that um, to keep the soil level as clean as it can be. And when I say that, I don't mean sterile clean. I have um, a neighbor who uses a weed blower to blow their soil clean. <laughs> this makes breaks my heart watching this. It's like crazy. Soil needs to breathe and it needs uh, food too, right? And bare soil is basically an invitation to weeds and it's also a, kind of a death threat because soil that's just bare and raked bare or blown bare, basically you're killing off the top a half inch or so, which is where most of the soil life actually is. So the better thing to do is to put down a layer, a healing layer, again, of compost or um, aged manure or something like that to just give it a blanket. Right? right. Excellent. <clears throat> Some people have, were asking me recently about what to do when their um, cover crops get too big. And they said, well, I'll, I if I pull up my cover crop, it disturbs the soil and destroys it. So one thing you can do, usually right around the winter holidays is a good time to give your cover crop, maybe you sowed it in the fall, like you were supposed to, um, give it a, a weed whack or cut it back to about 12 to 18 inches. And then right about now or next week when it warms up, you wanna do that again. And you can actually cut it even closer now. And instead of pulling it all up, you don't really have to do that because if we've used annual cover crops, they will rot in place, which is what you want. Um, and I use a lot of legumes like winter peas or fava beans or something like that. Well, they're storing nitrogen on their roots. If you pull one up, you'll notice the little white blobs. They look like cheap snap uh, beads. Those are little um, blobs of atmospheric nitrogen that the plant has pulled out of the air and stored in the roots. If you leave them there, cut the thing back, it will release that nitrogen into the soil and it will be available to your plants next season, which is coming right up. Oh, wow. I had no idea. That is fantastic. Yeah. 
Yeah. You'll see it same if you pull up um if you pull up Scotch broom or you pull up a an alder seedling where it's where you don't want you'll see the same thing. Those little nodules will be all over the roots. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's, they they're feeding themselves. Yeah, and feeding everybody around them. Yeah, right, exactly. So. <laughs> I know the one thing I'm really excited to hear about is plants for bird food, that what we can plant for the birds to come and feed on. Yeah, because, you know, a lot of people have heard that the um, there's some real problems with bird feeders and flocks of birds coming down from the northern forests. Because the northern forests have been really stressed by climate change, a lot of the cone production was really reduced this last couple of years. And when there aren't very many cones or the cones are not full, and the seeds are not fully formed or not, there aren't very many seeds, then the birds start to starve. And so that's, we've seen huge flocks of pine siskins coming down from the boreal forest, hungry and looking for food. And because they're starving, they're already stressed. And when birds congregate at a feeder, you know, they take the ones they want and they throw the other stuff out, which means there's a lot of litter on the ground. And that litter gets mixed with bird poop, of course, and it becomes a breeding ground for a lot of different diseases, including salmonella, a bacterial disease that's um, also affecting a lot of the finches. So people have been seeing dead finches and dead siskins around their feeders. It's really distressing. And yet these birds are hungry. Um, they're starving. So what are you going to do? So a couple things have been suggested. One is people, you can buy these big, uh, they almost look like a one of those snow saucers kids used to use that you can hang under your feeder and it catches all the litter. And if you clean that every day and then bleach it, you can put it back. That will prevent the um, the development of the diseases down there. But also oh, bird feeders become congregating places. You know, they invite a lot of birds to come. Of course, we like to see that, but it's not as healthy for the birds. So uh, another thing that you can do is start growing plants that will be productive for native birds, right? And that fits right in with sustainability because, of course, the native plants are the plants that will do the best for us with the least help. Uh, so you want to, you know, snowberry, salmonberry, huckleberry, hazelnuts, all that kind of stuff that um, that fruits and provides fruit and nuts and seeds. Um, so if you have a big tall fir, our firs are still producing big cones with lots of seeds in them. So that's like a natural bird food. One thing that happens a lot is when people buy a lot or start putting on an extension or something, they start to realize they have too many trees or not enough sun um, and start taking down the big trees. And, you know, replacing them with a little crab apple is not actually environmentally the same thing. <laughs> we have to really think twice or three times or five times before we take down some of our big mature trees because they really, not only are they, of course, creating oxygen for us, but they're hosting thousands of creatures uh, at every level from their soil up to their very top crown um, and and again it's not easily replaced mm -hmm. so cherishing our big native trees i think is really important for the last few years there's been a lot of die-off of smaller younger trees uh, like especially in the south end of the island i've seen the cedars dying in the woods and that's because we have been in a drought state for the last uh, uh, most of the last decade actually and I know that sounds funny after the January we had, <laughs> where it was not a drought, but the fact is it's like, it, you don't make it up by dumping a whole, you know, if you're dying of thirst and somebody pours water, a bucket of water on your head, it doesn't actually really do the trick. Um, so we still are needing that. And for many years, I used to say, never, never water native trees. Make sure they're out of range of your, if you have irrigation system, make sure they don't, overlap your natives because it really stresses them out. Well, in the last few years, even the Department of Natural Resources has started to say, you know, you might want to water some of your big trees because they really are so profoundly stressed. Um, and you can sort of see when you look at their silhouette, like a lot of the trees are not evenly dense or there's new growth out at the tips, but they look thin in the middle. And that's really a sign of stress. And that can be reversed by good you know, practice if we can remember to help them out with water in the summertime, even though it goes against everything we used to say, right? Uh, but I think it's an investment in more than just your garden. It's really an investment in wildlife too, that we are 
um, really helping birds. The other thing to think about with natural bird food is, is habitat, because a lot of the native shrubs and beautiful ornamental shrubs that um, provide food in the winter, seeds and nuts and berries, also can provide um, nesting and safety, you know, places to hide from cats or little other mammals and places to nest. A sheared hedge doesn't do that. Yeah. A sheared hedge of English laurel definitely doesn't do that. And there are plants that simply are not hospitable. I gotta say those English laurels are high on my list of, that wouldn't hurt the world if you were to take those out. <laughs> <laughs> but remembering not to shear, to let things, uh, if you have a plant that's too big for the site, so you're shearing it all the time to make it fit, that's a, it's kind of a message to, hello, move the plant. Um, we used to talk about the chainsaw relationship. <laughs> like if you have those big hedges, like the laurel hedges that you have to keep taking down by eight or 10 feet every few years and cutting in half every few years. That's a, that's a chainsaw relationship and it, it lasts until somebody dies, the owner or the plant, right? right? So those are the kinds of situations where you kind of look at your garden and think, wow, I'm spending more time hacking this thing to shreds than I am doing the stuff I really love might be a uh, time to rethink some of the designs that we put up, right? Mm -hmm. the, I, I think part of the issue is, you know, there's a, there's a whole style of gardening that's very tidy and it's linear and things are clipped and sheared and pruned and snipped and made into, in, made into boxes. That's not actually what nature does. Uh, and I think if you walk in the grand forest and take a look at the ground, you'll see it's not swept clean. It's got deep, beautiful mold that's made from, you know, years and years and years of leaves and twigs and fungus and all kinds of things falling out of lichens, um, turning into beautiful soil that really supports a huge range of plants. Um, in our own gardens and in our uh, shade gardens, especially our forested gardens, it's really important not to get too tidy. Uh, I'm kind of smiling because there's, I think I've had this conversation with a couple of you people <laughs> a time or two. <laughs> That's okay. I think we yes. just can hear it again. Well, I think, you know, we have the uh, tidiness is taught to us from a very young age. Mm -hmm. It's great in your house, but it's really not great in your garden because gardens need a little more wild. They need to be a little more natural if we want to support our frogs and we want to support our birds and we want to support all kinds of wildlife. That's the way to do it. Other plants to think about are the hardy fuchsias, the shrubby fuchsias, which make pretty good little hedges too. Some of them get six, eight feet high. And a lot of them, like those roses, will keep on blooming well into the winter. Um, and those are, you'll see them hummingbirds all over those things. I still have a couple smaller ones, basket ones that are still got flowers on their end, on their tips and the hummingbirds come and visit those every day. Uh, so. That's a great plant to look into if you have semi-shade. They really seem to bloom a lot longer um, than when they're in full sun. I saw my first dandelion bloom the other day walking down the um, Wyatt. I was so excited. <laughs> I see. Um, I'm trying to find my oh, camera. Hand up. Oh, uh, Sada, un unmute yourself. Well, wait a sec. I've got a, I got a comment from... Oh, comment. I'm trying to find the chat thing on here and I can't see it. Can you see it, Karen, and read I it? Here, let me let me get it. Uh, okay, well, come on, open up. Oh, there it is. Oh, Reed, Reed Price says, my spouse has encouraged me to keep moss on part of our patio. The birds seem to like poking around there. Yeah, and actually, of course, that's true. Um, moss supports quite a lot of different creatures and birds do like poking around because there's a lot of insects in there. Um, taking, you know, taking their rest in the winter, but insects, birds use insects as a support, as a supply of moisture. When the water's frozen and it's really cold, they'll find a nice juicy insect and eat that. Um, so yeah, and moss of course is natural here and there are many, many native mosses and they're beautiful. And so instead of having a struggling grassy lawn that's full of moss, why not have a beautiful moss garden and just carefully take out all the grass as it comes up, clump here, clump there, right? Um, and then start putting in some beautiful ferns.
ferns and some hellebores and some little ground orchids and some trilliums and all kinds of fun things you could put in um, and maybe stepping stones so that your beautiful moss doesn't get crushed. Um, it, it will go dormant in the summer, but again, if you are watering even mod modestly, it will stay green and beautiful. Um, a, a trip to Bloedel to their moss garden will show you some wonderful things to do with moss. But that would be our native version of a lawn because in this part of the country, they're really, except for there's, there are some areas of savanna, like Oki savanna down by, um, toward Tacoma and then out in the islands, there's a little bit toward Swim, there's some, but most of it's woods and forest. And in the forest, we have moss <laughs> everywhere. So I think cherish your moss, right? And treat it beautifully and it will um, it will reward you and it will never need fertilizing, yeah. right? It will never need to be mowed. Like almost no plant I can think of needs to be cut in half and fed and cut in half and fed all through the summer, right? So lawns are really a lot of trouble and they're also a monoculture that doesn't sustain anything else. They don't offer anything back. So I always kind of think if even in a beautiful, garden that might be very formal, you can still use materials, you can still use plants that will promote um, more life, more natural uh, life to come into your garden. The most un <laughs> unfriendly garden I ever was in was at Versailles where they have these, you know, it's tons and tons of paving and gravel and then these little jails, prison beds with uh, the same bedding plants in each of them. There's no life. You don't see birds, you don't see butterflies, you don't see bees, you don't see nothing. But tourists, it does seem to attract a lot of tourists. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But yeah, the moss is great. Keep the moss. Yes. Yeah, my, my favorite part of Bloedel is the moss garden. I remember, you know, coming from California and and we moved up here, finally went to Bloedel. That was the first uh, time I'd ever seen a moss garden. I'm like, wow. Wow. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, it's kind of funny because back in the day when they were first starting their moss garden, they um, treated it all with a weed killer. And right. then, of course, unable to grow moss for quite a long time and had to do a lot of restoration to, that was a long time ago. Right. Um, but people used to do that and without realizing that weed killers kill soil too and leave you with a lot of problems. So yeah, if you have an area that you want moss, just relax, you'll get it. <laughs> so you have a question. I do, it's back to the roses. <laughs> um, so I'm on a property um, on my sixth year and I inherited some roses. They're like 12 feet tall. I mean, they're, they're just way beyond. And I'm not sure whether I should just tackle them. I'm willing to start tackling them. I'm not sure if I should start tackling them a little for a couple of years or a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So the big old shrub roses like that, um, you can treat like almost any big shrub like that, that you would take out the oldest, gnarliest part every couple of years, take out two or three of the biggest, ugliest, and anything that looks, when you look at those plants, a lot of times you'll see the branch, the older branches are oh, twisted yeah. and gnarled but there are other nicer ones coming up that look young and straight and healthy. So you remove again, about a third of the oldest gnarliest ones every couple of years. And then in the, over the course of five or six years, you're gonna have totally refreshed shrub. And then what about the height? Well, the height is what it is. And so just okay. cutting it back, um, again, that's- so Maybe that's height. what it does, yeah. That's what it does, right? Mm -hmm. We have big rhododendrons that wanna be 20 feet high. They're gonna do that whether you, keep cutting them in half or not. So if you want smaller roses, that would mean maybe in front of them, you might plant some smaller roses that you can actually get close to. Um, right. But big ones, you know, they're gonna do what they're gonna do and fighting their nature doesn't ever really give you a good result. Right, that's the last thing I wanna do. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Sada. Sada, do you have a question? Sada yeah, has I, have, a question. I do, I have three questions. Okay. You're talking about fuchsias standard your standard fuchsias and your basket fuchsias i have both and i i pruned my standard back way back down and i think i used i have done it in the middle of march that's what my question is when do i prune the standard back so you mean shrubby upright shrubby fuchsias 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, upright, upright versus versus my other question is when do I prune? I put my hanging basket fishes into the garage because I have about 30 of them and I let them just dormant, go dormant until that's the other question. When should I take them out and prune them down too? So again, because we're looking into looking at a, a week or two of some very cold weather, I wouldn't do anything to anything yet. But once it starts warming up again and we know that we're going to have some warmer weather coming, you can cut the bushy shrub, the shrubby upright fuchsias back pretty much anytime you want to. Um, and they will refurbish really well. Again, I usually let them achieve their full size and height, which can be huge. Some of them are eight or 10 feet high and wide. And oh, other yeah. three yeah. feet. So part of the trick is, you know, if it's a plant that's actually too big for its site, you might want to move it or sustainably cause it to be moved by someone other than yourself. Um, but put it in a place where it can have its whole form and and not need a huge amount of pruning. Um, and then maybe just re start removing some of the oldest uh, stems as I talked about before. For your baskets, I definitely wait a little because it's, like I said, going to be really cold. But you could start watering them a little bit, just um, starting to wake them up slowly so that by March, mid-March is usually really safe to bring them out and then you can start um, watering and feeding them again. That's what I thought, mid-March, that's what yeah. I... Well, but it really yeah. depends on if, you know, if we get another cold uh, Arctic frost. Well, I'd, leave them in, I'd leave them in the garage. I, the hanging baskets, I won't bring them out until it's, yeah. Yeah, because you just don't know, but this, we don't know much about weather at all anymore, unfortunately. Did someone else have a question too, or? I do next one too, whenever somebody... Oh, you have another one? Go for it. Hydrangeas, when to prune my hydrangeas? Again, you can do them almost any time. It's, it's really hard to hurt a hydrangea. You can, you can cut so hard that you won't get much flowering this year on especially- oh, Yeah, I know that. <laughs> on especially the ones that bloom on um, an older growth. But again, with, um, a lot of the hydrangeas still have leaves on and you can see their buds swelling hugely. And a lot of times I'll go in again and prune out the ones that are lying on the ground or the what, the lowest branches because I want more of a vase shape than a big gumdrop blob. Same kind of thing. So you want light and air to get into the core of that. So where it's crowded, I look and take out the oldest, gnarliest stems all the way to the ground. And where there's some nice new thick stems coming up, then I would take out some of the older wood around it. A lot of times with the hydrangeas, if we don't prune them back, they start to get really um, twiggy at the ends and you get lots of small bloom, but not much big bloom. So you can take some of those stems out completely or take them back to a really fat set of buds. Um, and again, cut at a slant above them to avoid creating a, a wound. But you can do that pretty much anytime. They're very tough for the most part. With my azaleas, and I also have a whole load of azaleas as well. The azaleas, I have pruned back and taken all the dead stuff out, but it also has you just talking about moss and made me wonder. I took the moss off as much as I could with my hands and such, because uh, there's so much moss along the, ed, the branches of those azaleas that they, I don't know how they can breathe anymore. Actually, that you don't actually want to do that because all that moss and lichen that grows on plants, that's just something that happens here in the Northwest. They're symbiotic, they don't harm the plant at all and can actually be somewhat um, protective. So they're codependent, <laughs> if we can still say that, okay. in a good way, right? <laughs> Mutually dependent. Um, but yeah, that that's not a sign of disease or distress to have lichens and mosses growing on your plants. That's a symptom of being in the Northwest, the Maritime Northwest. So it's not a problem as such. Um, and yeah, taking it off could actually do some damage to the stem. So I probably wouldn't do that really, but um, you know, yeah. let it let it be. Well, they're growing, it's grown so much inside the hydrangea, the, the azaleas, you can't see the green leaves coming through anymore. All you see is the moss. So I just wanted to open it up. I felt like more air could get in there if, we, if I took a little, to get the leaves so they could breathe again. You mean way at the base? You're saying there's a lot of moss at the base or all the way up the stems? Or maybe all, the way up the, all the way up to the top, all the way up the stem. And these azaleas are probably uh, five feet tall. Some of them six feet tall. The azaleas, yeah. 
again, so, I wouldn't remove that from the stems. I mean, when the leaves come out, they'll be certainly bigger than the lichens along the stem. But you might you can send me a picture of it if you're really concerned, and I could let oh, you know. Okay. okay, thank you, Anne, so much. Sure. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. yeah, no problem. Okay. Hey, Anne, how is how uh, my kale is doing? Pretty well. Uh, is it going to do well in the sub freezing temperatures we're probably going to have in the next uh, four days? You know, kale, yeah, I mean, kale is one of those Siberian crops, too, that um, it does well way up into the, into the Northlands. And they always say kale and Brussels sprouts and even chard to some extent um, taste the sweeter after a frost or two. Ooh. Yeah, so it's fine. You know, they frost isn't their problem. They don't do as well in the hot sun, actually. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> they so. like a little afternoon shade. Um, cause they're really, they're very tough and they're year round plants. I have a, a number of perennial, uh, perennial kales that last usually four or five, six years. And then you take some cuttings off the tips and replant them, but they get four or five feet high and they're still going strong. Um, awesome. and, you know, it's, yeah, kale's pretty indestructible. Yeah, and also, and delicious. sorry. And delicious. And delicious, it's true. <laughs> and several people have asked me about, should they protect the spring bulbs that are starting to come up? And no, you don't have to do that. Because all those minor bulbs and daffodils and things come from parts of the world where it can be freezing cold quite often, especially at night and then even hot days. And they're well adapted to that and they don't need any protection at all. I do sometimes put like some shredded bark or fine mulch down to protect them from mud splash because the flowers look prettier when they're not splashy. Right, right. Um, but Good they idea. don't need frost protection at all. Wonderful. Let's see. Oh, and my uh, tea camellia, should I cover that for Sub-Zero? If it, Well, Sub-Zero, yeah. I mean, I, I mean not Sub-Zero, Sub-Freezing. Uh, Thirty below thirty-two degrees. It's on a deck, right? Right. So maybe throw a sheet over it at night and then take it off. Okay. Um, one thing you really want to think about is like when it's been when it's really cold, plants that get east light can mm -hmm. um, can have a lot more damage to their foliage if they have you know plants like a camellia that's evergreen, because when they um, go through the night and it's really cold and the cell the water in the cells freezes. If they get hit by morning light, that can they can explode. Those little cells mm -hmm. can explode. Mm -hmm. So you might want to. If the I don't know if your deck is east facing, but if it is, you might want to leave um, the protection on until sort of ten or eleven o'clock, say. Yeah, it's northwest. So. Oh, so then you're fine. But um, but east facing plants can get damaged in a really in a sharp sudden frost like that. Okay. Because of that froze freezing thing. Um, and you, yeah. Okay. You wanna give them a little protection so that they thaw out before the sun actually hits them. Okay, well, thank you. Thank yeah. You. Any other questions? Comments? <laughs> <laughs> Any other pearls of wisdom, Anne? As well, we I'm just trying to think. I guess I was gonna talk a little about starts. And oh, just- yes, uh, yes. Yeah that even though they're in the nurseries now and it is the right time of year, I'd still hold off a little because it is, again, we're looking at we, an unknown situation, possibly quite cold and probably want to wait a few weeks before we stick anything in the ground. And if you have starts and you were thinking about planting them and before this cold came through, you might want to put them in a garage or in a sheltered area on a covered porch, um, something like that. If you have a greenhouse or a sun porch, that'd be a great place to put anything that you were thinking about planting, but it's really probably going to need a little more protection for a few days, week, mm -hmm. maybe two. It's hard to say, really. Yeah. But yeah, I would, you know, this isn't, this would be the perfect time to, to do a lot of planting. It's still a good time to sow some seeds. The hardy annuals, can you could sow those seeds right now if you wanted to, and the little frost doesn't do anything but kind of egg them on. Um, and they'll sprout soon and be blooming. I think Bob thinks he's cuter than he actually is. <laughs> he, he likes that beard. He likes to show it off. <laughs> the thing is, if you sow stuff in the now for the hardy annuals, they'll be up and blooming sort of after the ones you sowed in the fall, which are already probably sprouting. 
I've got some calendulas blooming already from Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice. Uh, but you'll get a sequence that way. So if you plant annuals every month or so, you'll get a wave of them instead of just one, one blooming. And if you let them make set seed and go to seed themselves, not only will they'll self sow, but the birds will come and feast on them and that's more living bird food. Yes. I think that's one of the pieces I did want to say is like in the vegetable garden, always let a few of your annual vegetables go to seed and set seed and ripen seed. Because again, not only will they self sow and you'll have your very own kales, um, babies or lettuce babies, but you're going to support a lot of pollinators and then a lot of birds. So that cycle that we want to kind of continue means learn to be a little bit of a slob. I know that's hard for some people, but getting over our urge to keep everything neat and tidy outside is really important because if we want to promote actual life, we need to relax. Um, one great way to do that is to take your glasses off. <laughs> it's all soft view. You know, it's not going to bug you so much. <laughs> but just make sure that, you know, we're thinking about life and not tidiness because those things can be mutually exclusive. We always have this big joke at the library. We've been doing the Friday tidy for 23 years now or something. And <laughs> many times people have said to me, why did you call it that? You were like the least tidy gardener I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm just throwing stuff over my neck right behind me. <laughs> but I think tidiness, like we do want to open our shrubs, like I said, to light and air. We do want to rake away all the junk, the, the old leaves and sticks and things that are underneath. But then you want to replace with something healthy. We don't want bare earth. We want a nice healing blanket of compost or aged manure um, to cover the soil and let it refurbish. And one interesting thing, I, there was a study that came out, I think two years ago, that found that a quarter inch of compost on bare soil started recharging the carbon sequestering in like a week. Mm. So that's something to just think about, like bare earth. And when every time you dig and disturb the soil, you release all the little nutrients stored in that soil. And it looks like a flush of wonderful, healthy, you know, nutrients and the plants take off. But then they start to falter because we've depleted the soil. Mm. And again, most of the nutrients are actually on the top. Right. So. I think everybody's familiar with the, having gone out to the garden in the summertime and you've got your corn is withering a little and everything looks a little distressed and the plants are kind of small. And right next to it, these lusty six foot high weeds are happy as clams, right? Because that soil is undisturbed and undisturbed soil functions much, much better to um, support plants. I had no idea. Yeah. So, you know, the, having the bare soil is never the, the optimal um, no. result. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And disturbing the soil as little as possible is a really major goal. Okay. So go natural. <laughs> Take your glasses off. Be happy. <laughs> Especially carrots. I, did I, I told you about the story when I left. We left carrots go to seed. And oh, and when you had baby carrots all over the place. We had carrot. I mean, it was the gift that just kept on giving. <laughs> The thing about carrots is, you know, Queen Anne's lace, which is everywhere, are mm -hmm. a wild carrot cousin, and they'll often cross. And if you let carrots go to seed and you grow them out year after year, they'll actually usually dwindle, um, and you'll start getting white carrot roots that taste pretty bitter, which is much mm -hmm. more like the ancient um, forms. So if you want carrots and do your own seed, you can do that, but you do if it only is good for a couple of years, and you probably want to buy new seeds to make sure you're getting something nice and juicy. Right. Yeah. That's what we did. But uh, that, that was fun, though. I, that, that's the first time it ever happened. And it was just, you know, it was like, wow. It was like a gift. And well, I hope yeah. the birds came and enjoyed the seeds, too. So. Sure they did. And I'm sure that <laughs> they were covered with pollinators when they were in bloom, too. Right? That's right. Exactly. So wonderful. All right. Anybody else? Well, I guess you covered everything, Anne. <laughs> did, did the rose thing come out did you get i mean i sort of talked roses in two or three chunks and i hope that that made sense yeah right well there you go sharpen your tools and okay. get that linseed oil out put go outside and put wd-40 on it but don't do it in your living room oh. right. 
Phew. <laughs> <laughs> Things up the house, right? Yes, yes. <laughs>